Welcome everyone to our Justice Roundtable, a conversation of the justice dialogue that uh, facilitates us bringing together, that facilitates Christian citizens coming together who are working, laboring, living, and praying uh, for a more just society. Uh, I am eager for us to continue uh, to begin the conversation today uh, that Reverend Laura Ayala will open up for us. And I trust that this will be a very meaningful time for all of us. I am Lisa Harris Lee, and I serve with the American Baptist Home Mission Societies as the Director of Healing and Transforming Communities. In a moment, I will open us up with prayer. And then I'm going to invite uh, Reverend Salvador Arellana to introduce Reverend uh, Ayala, and uh, then we will continue the conversation. Something I want to encourage you to do is really utilize the chat feature. Uh, following this meeting, uh, you will receive a recording of, of this, um, this conversation, as well as um, notes that were left in, in our chat. As we meet monthly, this group will continue to uh, convene monthly uh, and uh, you will begin to see um, names and, and faces that will show up uh, repeatedly during these monthly conversations. More and more, we want to facilitate, the American Baptist Home Mission Societies wants to facilitate your deeper engagement with ABHMS, and your deeper engagement with each other. This is a, a community uh, that we are seeking uh, to really nurture uh, for, uh, for the benefit of one another on the call and for the benefit of the communities that we serve. So um, let us uh, begin with this prayer, if you'll allow me. Uh, Reverend Dr. Patricia, Murphy, who serves on the American Baptist Home Mission Societies as the American Baptist ecclesiastical endorser for our, our chaplains, reminded us that this is a pastoral and spiritual care week. And in reminding us of that, she offered, uh, she offered a prayer for us that uh, focuses on the blessing of our hands. And in this prayer, there's an invitation for us uh, to look at our hands. So that's what I want to invite all of us to do in this moment is to pause and look at our hands. How beautiful they are. The stories um, that these hands could tell. Don't take your hands for granted. Through this week, I want to invite you to pause and, and take moments to ask God to continue to bless of the work of your hands. Think of all that you do with your hands each day that contributes to the spiritual, emotional, physical, intellectual well-being of others and yourself. Let us pray. Oh God, Holy One, Consecrate these hands that they may continue to do good, to heal, to love, to care, and be the source of comfort for others. This is our prayer. As a follower of Jesus, I offer it. Amen. Salvador, can I invite you now, please? Sure. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I have the privilege to introduce uh, Reverend Laura Ayala, who is the senior pastor of Primera Iglesia Bautista de Rio Piedras in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Reverend Ayala excels in preaching, teaching, strategic planning, and leadership development. She's a communicator a motivator, a bridge builder, who has served in a variety of American Baptist leadership roles, including former Associate Executive Minister of Iglesia Bautista de Puerto Rico, and various committees and boards, including American Baptist Commission Societies, American Baptist Women in Ministry, 
as a convener, American Baptist Home and Hospital Association, AB uh, Neighborhood Action Program, among others. She is the founder of the Community Outreach Ministry, Corporación Milagro del, del Amor, in, in Caguas, Puerto Rico. Reverend Ayala is currently a PhD candidate in theology, writing a dissertation concentrated on the church in Puerto Rico, uh, the years uh, 1912 to 1921. That was at uh, that time, rebuilding from a severe hurricane and earthquake, living through political strife and the pandemic of 1918, enduring realities similar to today. So we welcome Reverend Laura Ayala. Hello, everyone. I see so many faces of people that I haven't seen in a while, and I'm so happy to see you all and have this opportunity, which is a blessing, um, to be able to share just a little bit of uh, what's going on right now. So I want to start um, sharing with you a screen, and I have someone else that I have asked to join me um, here in this uh, presentation. moment here. Okay, there we go. Okay, so what I'm showing you here is a map, probably some of you have seen it before, it's to, you have an idea, you know, where we are in, in Puerto Rico, and that is the map of Puerto Rico and where is San Juan the capital and within San Juan, we have Rio Piedras and that's the actually is like the square that you see in yellow, which are the um, a bigger like avenues that surround the city. But you, you see this red circle, that's our community. There is like a little red dot in the upper left corner of the circle and there it's where the church is located so basically when I call when I talk about community and when I talk about Rio Piedras these these are my communities where we are located Rio Piedras was founded as a city in 1714 so we have more than 300 years of history in this location and so that you have an idea, the University of Puerto Rico was founded in 1903. So basically, the community has been here way longer than the church. Um, so I just wanted to uh, bring that up. And this is basically how our church looks. We were literally the first, the real first Baptist church established by American Baptist Home Mission Societies in Puerto Rico back in 1899. So we will be celebrating our 123rd anniversary this coming uh, February. Uh, we are very um, happy that this was the place where God allow us to be. So there are some things that you might no, know, may know or not. So I just want to keep it, bring you to context. One is that our church became the operation center for the recovery of our eight communities after Hurricane Maria. Rio Piedras, uh, as, a, as a, this circle that I showed you before, is organized in eight communities with its own leadership and particularities in terms of needs and, and cares and programs. And um, so we come together, we serve and we come together to serve. And we work, we became the operations center um, it was an organic situation. It was not something that we planned, nothing, not something that we asked. It just happened. And, and it was a great experience. I have shared about that in other contexts. Um, but then after that, we received volunteer missionaries to do roof repairs and rebuilding. And that was uh, between, actually, I, it was wrong. It was 2018 to 2021. And during this period, we have um, built or rebuilt um, over 416 roofs. And we serve during, now during the pandemic, close to 10,000 meals in eight weeks between May and June of year 2020. And due to the pandemic, we open our sanctuary, literally our, our sanctuary to serve 
um, children so that they can they could attend their online classes. So we realized that our kids didn't have the opportunity to take their classes because they didn't have internet services in their homes or and or they didn't have uh, the equipment needed, either a tablet or a, 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 a computer. So basically what we did is that we opened our sanctuary and literally became a big classroom where our children could come to take their classes um, with the required support system for so that they could do that. And along with that, we distributed over 85 tablets for children and youth in our communities to take their classes. And currently we are, we have just started our music academy. So that's the new project we are working on right now. So today, the topic that for which you're here for is to hear about faith leaders within community. And something that I uh, asked was two of a good collaborators that now I call friends to join me here. Um, because instead of me starting to talk about the uh, my role as a faith leader within community, what if we hear what leaders from the community, uh, people who are active working in the community can tell you about how they saw and how they currently see the role of a faith leader within the community work. So the, the first one is Daniela, uh, and I will allow her to present herself. Uh, Daniela, we have less than five minutes, so go ahead. Okay, I'll go really fast. So first of all, I need to start off by like, it's an honor to be here with everyone of you. Um, and thank you to Pastor Laura to allowing me to be here. But um, my name is Daniela Talavera Pagan. I am a case manager in Proyecto Plaza Corazón, and we're going to talk a lot, a, a little bit of what we do and who we are. So uh, a little bit about Estancia Corazón. We are a nonprofit community-based organization. We were funded in 1991 in the municipality of Mayagüez, which is in the west corner of Puerto Rico. Um, Estancia Corazón was is composed of four different projects and we all serve marginalized populations such as the homeless population, HIV positive individuals, people who control, uh, control substances, LGBTQ plus community among other marginalized communities. And since 1998, Estancia Corazón uh, extended their services and created Proyecto Plaza Corazón in San Juan and that's uh, my organization, and we're going to talk a little bit about us now. Um, so Proyecto Plaza Corazón, we work in the Rio Piedras uh, community, as Pastor Laura said. Um, we offer support services mostly to the homeless population and HIV at risk populations and to low income resources um, communities. And what do we do? We do a lot of things, but among those services, we canalize safe and permanent or transitional housing. We obtain personal documents. We do also cleaning, as you can see in the pictures on the streets. Um, we canalize mental and physical health services, do HIV rapid testing, accompany participants to medical or legal appointments, work with any barrier that we identify with the participants. And in conclusion, we are just a voice of the community when they feel they don't have one, but we also try to give that confidence to the participants of themselves feeling um, part of the society and having that voice that they deserve. Um, but why we're here um, in terms of a little bit of our religious background and we're getting a little bit personal, but in terms of my religious background, I don't practice any structured religion. I studied in a Catholic school for 13 years and I saw a lot of things that um, I didn't really believe in, in terms of people preaching what they didn't act on. Um, so I really uh, embarked on my personal spiritual journey and when I started working in Proyecto Plaza Corazón, the facilities that we have actually are in the first Baptist church here, where now I'm like one room away from Pastor Laura. So they're here. And when I got here, I was like, oh no, this is a church organization. Like we're gonna probably 
say a lot of things, but not do anything in community and not be like um, in there with them and working with the real needs of society. Um, but then I started working here and the Baptist church is just the our top collaborator. As I said, we were, so we are, we work on the streets and we didn't have an office when we started working with the Baptist church and they gave us an office where we can have our documentations, where we can, we even have air conditioning, which is a privilege for us because we have a, another building that doesn't even have electricity. Um, they have worked, we do a lot of collaboration in terms of giving food to the most uh, people that mostly need it. They give us a lot of monetary funding as well, but most of all, they're just very active on the streets with us. So they, we really, really, really work hand in hand. It's not, hey, we need this and they give it to us. No, it's like they also see the needs in the streets and the needs of the people that we work with. And they really do work hand in hand with us. So after three years working in this organization, I just, this literally this experience and having this relationship with the church has really, really changed my perspective in terms of there are religious leaders that are really interested in working with social needs and and go beyond you know staying in this structured space that we call church and taking that belief and values of the church and leaving it in in action so yeah <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say thank you. And I have to be honest with you. I didn't know what Daniela was going to say. Um, so thank you, Daniela, for, for sharing that. Um, and I really want to cry, but I'm not going to. And now I want you to hear, uh, I believe that Angel is here. Angel, are you here, Angel? Angel? I believe he is. He is here, but he's muted. Ah, oh, I'm muted. <laughs> Sorry. Please, please unmute yourself. Um, and yep. and Angel, Angel Perez, I just have this slide of you. He didn't know I was going to do a presentation, so that's why there's nothing here from him. But basically, I met him when he was part of CAUSE, which is like an arm of the University of Puerto Rico here in Rio Piedras. And now he works in CAUAS in an organization called Nuestra Escuela. But I don't want to talk nothing else. I want Angel to speak to you. Well, how 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 Lara says I I know I don't I don't know if I have presentation for you. Uh, first of all, my English is not a good one. I will try. Uh, uh, if if I, I if I said uh, some some word that not is right to use, so sorry. But <laughs> but my my first language is the Spanish. And I'm I'm proud of. Uh, well, what what I can say. Uh, for for me, uh, the the Baptist Church is uh, is 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 it's just great uh, to work with them because uh, in my I I'm from a house of of people of Christianity people, and I am very disliked for the for the church because I think the church don't don't walk the way of Jesus uh, that Jesus says. Uh, if 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 you if not understand, just tell me. I try, okay. Uh, if you want, you can switch to Spanish. I'll translate you. It's okay. It's, it's more it's more good. <laughs> Dale, <laughs> go ahead. Un poco comentarle, verdad, que para mí eh, trabajar con la Iglesia Bautista ha sido algo super nítido porque for, for me to work with the Baptist Church has been something very nice because. Eh, yo vengo de una familia cristiana. Eh, I come from a Christian family. Pero en el camino uno se ha ido decepcionando de lo que ha venido haciendo las iglesias. Which has been very deceitful of what the churches have done. My experience has been that one. Porque uno entiende que las iglesias se han alejado demasiado de lo que se supone que sea el camino que dicta Jesucristo, ¿verdad? Y, y las ayudas que, que él este, fue haciendo durante el camino de su vida. Because I have seen how churches have um, distanced from what Jesus taught and the way Jesus uh, proclaimed the gospel and identified himself with the marginalized. 
Así que en el camino del, del proceso de Huracán María nos encontramos con Laura y con Belkis y de ahí en adelante han sido dos mujeres que se han convertido en mis amigas, en mis guías, en gente que uno adora porque simple y sencillamente demostraron cómo es que realmente debe trabajar un cristiano. So since Huracán María, I started working closely to Pastor Laura and Pastor Berkis. Berkis is the pastor of a Pentecostal church close by, and we are actually good friends. And he's saying that since that, he was very identified with these two women that became his friends um, because we were able to work together with what uh, we were doing here in the recovery of the city. Así que nada, decirles que, que el trabajo que se viene haciendo aquí en Puerto Rico es un trabajo que rompe el paradigma. So I just want to tell you know that the work that is being done here with, with, the, church, with the church is something that breaks the paradigms. Y, y que el, ¿verdad? Lo, lo que estamos aquí exponiendo sirva para que ustedes también sigan haciendo este tipo de cambio. Yo creo que el cristianismo le hace falta mucho más calle. Este... Y, 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 y verlo en la iglesia Bautista de Río Piedra, me parece que, que es algo que les puede ayudar a ustedes para que los reproduzcan en sus respectivos lugares. And I hope that for what you will be hearing here, um, you're able to uh, see what we want uh, to the Christian, the Christian church to really become, um, that we think that the church in general has to learn a lot and to walk the streets and learn from the streets so that it could become pertinent uh, to the real communities that we are handling now. I made a summary. <laughs> Gracias. Agradecerle, agradecerle, ¿verdad? Que, que tengan aquí a Laura como, como parte de las que está exponiendo en todo esto, porque realmente están haciendo un cambio. Y lo otro es que demostrar que los, pasto, los pastores pueden ser gente chévere después de esta. Mato a Laura porque no me dijo que íbamos a presentar. Tal vez me he preparado un poco mejor. <laughs> <laughs> he's saying that uh, he's very grateful uh, for the giving me the opportunity to expose here. That probably after this, he will kill me for not telling him that I was give, giving a present formal presentation. But that um, that he's very, um, anyway, I don't know if Salvador wants to add something else. But we want, we really want to, I want you to hear. Salvador, you want to say something from what he just said? Because no, I was laughing. I think you said everything, yeah. I think you said it, yeah. Okay, why I wanted to do this? Well, we are talking about faith leaders and within community. And I think that this is extremely, extremely important that we are able to talk about this. Actually, you see Angel there in the corner from day one putting tarps in the top of roofs. Okay, so what, how voices of faith leaders I heard among community stakeholders and decision makers? Just a few points which we, I want to close this. First, the first thing I think that we have to evaluate if, is our willingness to become that voice or not. And this is very serious. Like you heard, these are people that are extremely active within the community, taking care of many of the needs and the experience that them as a sample, because this is what I've heard from many others, is that churches usually are completely disconnected of the reality of what's going on in the streets and in their communities. They are there, their buildings are there, but they don't know the people, they don't know what the needs are. And so most of the time, they're not willing to become part of the solution of the different situations that are around. And these are not my words. These are words from people that I work with. Um, so first of all, we need to evaluate if we're really willing to become the voice of a faith leader within that community, because it's a big responsibility that we are uh, undertaking. Uh, this begins as something personal, because it depends on you as a person, but yet it involves and impacts the church. So basically what you will be doing as a person will involve the church wanting it or not. So the impact will be there. Um, people of the church, members of the church will start to hear what's going on and they might agree or not with the way that you as a person, um, you are getting involved in the, in the issues. So this is something that you have really um, to need to know and also to start or begin by educating the community, the church community. Um, another thing that you need to be aware is about your role as a faith leader, you could be a very active one, 
you could be passive, but I, my opinion is that you need to be both. And by passive, I mean that you are a step back. You let others to lead. You let others to be the faces and be the ones that do the, do the represent the community. Um, I am not here um, to represent this community. I am here to be part of it. And sometimes we are so used to being um, in the front lines or being our name seen in places or uh, because of our um, education or our background. And when you become part of the community, um, it will it is not well seen when you just come along after not being there and then you want to take over. So this is not well seen. And I don't think it's needed either. We I have seen so much um, richness in our community and uh, knowledge um, formal and informal that my role has been more to be uh, a connector, a bridge builder, um, and probably help those that might not have the right words or might not quote unquote look the way uh, to access certain power positions or access certain uh, uh, policy makers and be that the one that opens the door and be there and, uh, and teaches them and, uh, and be with them so that they could be active with what they need to do. Um, something else is that you must be open to learn. Um, we don't know it all, no matter how much we know, no matter how many degrees we have, trust me, when you get to the com involved in the community and you are walking the streets, you realize that you don't know anything. <laughs> um, you know, might know a lot of theory. You might not. You might know a lot of theology, but the way things work in real life is something else. So you have to. You must be open to learn and and to be consistent, be real, be honest, and be yourself. Um, people want religious leaders to be real people, not to be what we think they want us to be, but be real, laugh with them, joke with them, dance with them, uh, walk with them, cry with them when it's needed, and also be very upset when we realize what people in power positions do, um, but also be honest and ask for forgiveness when it is needed. Um, because sometimes we do need to ask for forgiveness. Um, be aware of the time that it will take away from traditional pastoral duties. Um, if the church is not prepared for this, it's very hard to do. I am extremely grateful for our congregation at this time um, because they have been even taking over traditional pastoral duties so that I could take time to be with the community and be involved in meetings and committees and all kinds of things that are going on right now as we speak. Um, the other thing is that your deeds and words, and in that order, will be witnessing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, people sometimes are very um, skeptic. They don't, they, don't want to, they don't want nothing to do with religion, church, or Jesus Christ. And mostly it's because they might not be aware of what the real gospel is, what the real word of Jesus is. And once they know that, then there's another problem. They can see the disparities between those words that Jesus said and what Jesus thought and what the, ch the church as an organization or as people are actually doing. So you have to deal with that and your deeds will be more important than any word you could say. So right now, um, I am extremely honored to be part of the leadership of this community work hand in hand with them, walk with them in their shoes, not mine. And it has been a great experience to continue to learn uh, many, many things uh, and be that one that can actually uh, bridge with other positions within our larger community of the municipality and the government. So thank you for this opportunity. And I'm open to any questions. Laura, that was that was beautiful. And yes, we are. I would like to start with questions. You can put them in the chat. You and and that will actually be the best thing. Or raise your hand uh, if you have a question. There are others in the community similar to our last dialogue. There are others who are in the community today who I've invited to ask a question, to respond or comment on what they've heard Pastor Ladder share. 
and even share some of their own experiences. And, and Pastor Lara, thank you for bringing your collaborators with you, Daniela and, and, and Angela. Thank you for bringing them with you. And thank you to both of you, Daniela and Angel, for sharing uh, with us and being part of our community today. Pastor Avilius Bernal, please begin and, and offer your comments as you have a, your hand raised as well. Oh, I know. Just thank you very much for, for what you've been doing. I'm wondering, uh, Laura, um, sometimes when you're doing work in the community that is active, there's the usual concerns about the church that we have heard from, and I'm glad that you got through that. But how have you, how have you been able to connect your voice with the, you know, the power brokers or the people in authority who sometimes feel that, that you're stepping in their space and, uh, and they'd rather be the ones that look good instead of the church? How, how do you maneuver the, the powerful people into collaborating instead of you know, getting in the way? Well, I, I think that that will depend on your on our understanding of powerful people. In our context, something that is very emphasized is that the power is within the community and the people who live here, the people who work here and the people who do business here. So basically, we are organized uh, by communities, as I mentioned before, and also by sectors. So right now, the religious sector met and they uh, assigned me and the priest, actually we work together, um, to be the representatives of the religious sector within the board of the community. But we also have business representatives, students from the university, and also from each of the eight communities nearby. So basically here we are trying to be very uh, emphatic on that the power is within the community and the people. So that's where the real power is. Some others think they have the power, like the municipal government, like the state government or the agencies. Well, that's what they think, but we are changing that in different ways. So first of all, because there is a law that was created many years ago that gives us the power to become organized and to speak up for the community. Um, as part of that law is a community that is called interagencial, interagencies. So every month, we gather with the representatives of each of the main uh, departments of service departments from state government and municipal government and whatever needs are there, we bring them to the table. And every month they have to come back and give a report on how they handle those and what they did with those. So they are accountable to the community, not the other way around. Um, the other thing is that um, for example, in my case, I have been helping with uh, grant writing uh, recently for two uh, uh, particular things that were up and we could apply. So I am not taking the lead. I am supporting what the community says they need. Um, so I'm there uh, taking notes. I'm there uh, giving them mentorship if needed in some administrative work or, or things like that. But it's in the background. Um, when we go to a meeting, like we did recently, to the University of Puerto Rico, uh, uh, I don't know the word, I think it's the dean um, of the university here, um, we went with the president of our board, which is a community uh, resident, and I just sat next to her. So I will just keep like, you know, uh, coaching on, on what to do, but I, I try to step back. It's hard because we are used to being in the front line. We're used to being the ones who speak and talk and decide and say. Um, so it's hard sometimes, but it's it's beautiful to see people glow and, and learn and accomplish things. And at the end, know that it's not a one person a, a success, but a, a, but a community or a team success. And that really makes a big difference. The power within community is big. If we uh, are with them, Sometimes we just need to step forward and, and just be the ones that say to the powerful, quote, quote unquote, eh, I guess you better shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. Listen to them. They know. And they hear us because we are the pastors or we are the religious leaders. If not, we pray for them and it's not going to be nice. So um, they, they have to, <laughs> they have to, they listen, they listen. Very good, very good. Is there anything else you'd like to share, uh, Pastor 
Douglas. Well, I mean, there's, yeah, I don't want to take too much time, but I just want to say that there, there is a, this tendency to say that that in order for change to be enacted, you need to be you need to be seen, you need to be public, you need to be charismatic and followed, and 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 that's one of the things that you know, especially in in, in the United States, we run into that often that 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 the way to change is to be charismatic and upfront, and so so modeling this, I think, very Baptist and very fundamentally Christian process. Uh, have you run into into other sides who maybe some people would say, well, you know, you should be taking advantage of this, or you you should be more, or you know, or something like that. Yeah, usually Christians will tell me that, um, <laughs> and and probably other pastors. Um, but uh, we know we know better than that. Something that we've learned also is that we don't have to know it all or have it all. What we have is enough to support the community. So sometimes it's a space, sometimes it's uh, uh, equipment, sometimes it's our presence, um, sometimes it's our kitchen. Like today, we are feeding the homeless today with Daniela and her team. Um, and yet we have the food, we brought together the cook, we have uh, people who are helping, they actually help us. They get in our kitchen to do a lot of work but they are the ones who know the homeless. They are the ones who work with them every single day. So um, I might not have gained the trust of the homeless in this community, but they have in a day-to-day -day basis. So it's not about us, it's about the people in need. And if the best people to serve them is Estancia Corazón, then they are the ones who should be there, not necessarily us. So we support their work and that's the way we complete or com accomplish our mission. Very good, very good. There are two colleagues on the call, both of whom I know need to leave the call early. Uh, um, Ms. Dewana Wade, who is the Executive Director of Salama Urban Ministries, I invited her to speak, and also uh, Reverend Marin Song of the Massachusetts Baptist uh, Multicultural Ministries in Lowell, Massachusetts, Salamas in Tennessee. Um, may I ask for a moment, uh, uh, Dewana, are you able to offer a comment briefly? And then I would like for Mar to share and, and then again, to be continued. But Dewana, can you share something briefly? And then I'll ask Mar if you'll follow. Absolutely, thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Dr. Laura, Angel and Daniela for sharing. Um, and honestly, my comment is only going to be to co-sign and or reinforce what's already been said because in our community here in Nashville, there's a lot of great things going on and there continue to be a great deal of families who live in marginalized communities and have marginalized experiences. And oftentimes we at Salama, I, as the director of Salama, am asked to speak, quote unquote, for some of those people um, because of the work that we do. And our work is primarily focused on youth development. Um, and we work really hard, just like Dr. Laura said, to um, remind people that we cannot speak for people. We can share our personal experiences in marginalized um neighborhoods and experiences, but we refuse and we make sure to say that while I won't say that for these folks, I will absolutely encourage the people that we have a relationship with, we have influence with, to come and share their own stories, to come and share their own solutions for the challenges that they recognize in their neighborhoods. And so, um, I, I absolutely agree with Angel and um, Angel and Daniela regarding sometimes we Christians um, do more to push people away from um, the gospel um, than we do to bring them to the gospel. And it's important for us to show up simply as human beings in this fight for justice across the world. And so gentrification is in our neighborhood, overrunning violence is in our neighborhood. Um, poor public education outcomes are in our neighborhood, poor healthcare and things of that nature. It doesn't matter to our families what our religious background is. It matters that they understand that we are in the fight with them rather than for them. And so 
thank you all for um, your continued work, everyone on the call, um, your continued work in making sure that we show up um, and have voice with rather than have voice for. Well stated, Dewana. Thank you so much. Again, let me invite quickly Mar. Uh, can you share, please? Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mar Yumstam. Uh, thank you, Lisa, for the opportunity given to me to participate here with wonderful colleagues around the United States and Puerto Rico for the work of justice. And I'm just so impressed and would like to say thank you to Pastor Laura Ayala for the work that you do there in that part of the world and the way that you do the work by partnering and networking. Thank you, Daniela De La Vera. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing correctly for the work that you do there, right in the route. And Dr. Angel for partnership. And I think it is very similar to kind of work that I do here in this part of the United States in Massachusetts. I'll try to be very brief. But I just would like to applaud the partnership and networking that we have to do as a clergy and, uh, uh, you know, as uh, faith leaders in our work of justice. So um, I'll tell you why I'm wearing my clergy <laughs> color today. But anyway, so I was just, you know, we are responding to the work of justice in the last two years very much in the area of ever evolving new normals. And I know many of you might have read the Bishop N.T. Wright books of God in the pandemic, a Christian reflection on the coronavirus and the aftermath. And, you know, he asked a question in that book and he said, where was Jesus in the coronavirus? And he said that, you know, Jesus must be there out in the front line suffering and dying and bring healing and hope. And that's the kind of a nutshell, that's what he does. Uh, I think we are trying to do. And actually he invites all the faith leaders like you and I to participate as a follower of Jesus in page 66 of the book. Do they be grieve in prayer at the heart of the world's pain? New vocation may emerge both of healing and wisdom. And he said, holding mirror, holding mirror to those in power to show what has needed to be done. So in a nutshell, I think as a clergy, as a faith leaders during this new normal life, we have been trying to be there in the community, attending the school committee meetings, or attending the partners organization meetings, and also all the time holding mirrors to the powerful, what needs to be done in order for justice to be really implemented. So in a nutshell, that's what we have been doing uh, as a very small organization. But at the same time, I really like the way that, that Pastor Laura has talked about how we can partner with like-minded organization because you and I don't have the time, but we do the work and how we can partner. So I just would like to share in another, maybe three minutes here, um, how we partner. For instance, like just before, prior to my uh, Zoom meeting here today, I was there for a uh, ACE detention bone hearing. That's why I'm wearing my clergy robe because all the ACE detention bone hearing is now virtual. So I was able to attend that. And we partner with Boston Immigration Justice and Accompaniment Network. And I wish I can talk more about it, but I'm not going to do it. But as a matter of fact, I was just there, you know, a few minutes before for Alexander, who fled a homophobia, government persecution, and notorious. MS-13 gang in El Salvador and ran into this country in the month of April, but was in a deten in detention center for in three different places where he was beaten 
by their own inmates or you know, people, those who are near in the detention center for being a gay and also by the official guard there. But I'm just so happy and I celebrate today that we bait, you know, we raised, we were able to raise with all the partner organizations $6,000 for the bone hearing, which is a one-time hearing for anyone in the AIDS detention center. And he was granted a bond hearing granted, and then he will be let go from the detention center for Alexander. And another thing that we have been partnering and working very extensively in and our advocacy work is, as you all know, the Title 42 to deport immigrants from southern border on the ground of health and safety reasons, despite the many access that United States has for such as, you know, the vaccination or rapid test. But then uh, this even, you know, I, I know that uh, I don't have time to tell you the, all the history about this. I know you know the history about the Title 42, which was originally actually brought forward by the former uh, administration from the Homeland, uh, uh, Homeland Security, you know, Department, U.S. Department of Homeland Security even though it was kind of naively put, put as the uh, recommendation of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, which we don't, many of them don't agree. But even now with the Biden administration that is being administered. So we are working how the Title 42 invocation can be revoked. And we are able to partner with a like-minded organization with Massachusetts Refugee Immigration and uh, Re Refugee and Immigrants Coalition, MIRA. And I had a lot of opportunity to participate there. And the other thing that we are also working with the affordable housing, and the affordable housing is a catch-22 because like with the pandemic now, all these, uh, you know, tenants, uh, landlord rights have been taken away. We are facing a lot of problems. So we have been working with, for instance, like different housing authority and housing uh, nonprofit organization to provide all these housing benefits for people, especially for undocumented people. And we are just so glad that with many of our conversation happening, with Worcester Community Action Council, the city of Worcester in Massachusetts now can offer all those relief and all those financial assistance through SUT, you know, for even for undocumented uh, uh, people. Mar, okay. I, I need to interrupt only and, and to put a parenthesis to say a to be continued. Is there just a closing comment before we, I need to, want to hear from others and give the larger community opportunity to share as sure. well. Please, please put uh, comments in the chat, Mar, if other things to share. Thank you. And the website. All right, thank you. Okay, Mar, Mar, thank you so much. So at this time, I'm actually, I'm going to pause for the larger community. There are two others who I want to invite to, to share, but are there comments or questions? Again, please just raise by a raise of a hand. Uh, or a comment in the chat uh, will uh, will address. Because Mar, I, I also know- I think Clifford Johnson's hand is up. Yeah, oh, okay. oh, thank you. Yes, please, Dr. Johnson. Good afternoon. First, let me thank you, Lisa, for convening this group and for Laura for a very fine, uh, informative and beneficial presentation. I just wanna make two comments because um, I've been fully engaged in this work and continue to be fully engaged in this work and our church is committed to it. One is that when you're doing this work, trust is so important. The community has to trust you. They've been let down by so many people, so many organizations, you've got to develop this trust. And the trust doesn't happen overnight. It takes a while. So therefore there has to be a constancy and also transparency. And once you get their trust, they will follow you. The second thing I want to say that while and to encourage all those doing this work, that while this group was saying, ah, we don't need the church, we don't need the church, there's a larger group that always says, where is the church? 
So when they see you, they get behind you and assist you doing this work. And that's what makes it happen. As long as, you, as long as you're constant, as long as you're transparent, somebody out there will get behind you and justice will roll down like water. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson, for sharing. Uh, again, other uh, comments? Um, well, then let me go ahead and invite uh, Reverend Joy Martinez Marshall, who is a pastor of First Baptist Church of Lincoln, Nebraska. If you'll, you'll share either response uh, to what you've heard uh, Reverend Lara share or comments of different ways you are engaged in with the power brokers in the community. Yes, thank you. I'm a newcomer to this community, so I am grateful for the invitation and glad to be here. I really uh, loved what Dr. Laura talked about when um, she was saying that there's work already being done in the community and a way of partnership is um, figuring out what, where God is already at work and the strength of um, being bridge builders instead of attempting to uh, create something new. So I really uh, really love that. And I appreciated the comment that you said, be yourself and be consistent. I know that that is, uh, that always turns me off from other leaders when I feel like they're not authentic or they're just making stuff up because they think I want to hear that. And so I really, really um, love that. We are in, of course, Lincoln, Nebraska, which is a really random area of the United States right here in the middle, often flown over and forgotten. Uh, but I hope you're enjoying the corn because it's been harvested here for the past however many weeks. Um, but what we're trying to do at First Baptist uh, Lincoln is we share the building with three other congregations and two of them are refugee populations. We uh, share the building with Lincoln Corinne Baptist Church. And so with that, we've been doing a lot to advocate and partner uh, with them as they are fully incorporated into the ABC Nebraska region. And right now with the violence going on, um, a lot of their families have been affected. So we've done fundraisers and things like that to advocate for them. But with that work uh, comes to recognize where we've overstepped and where we've attempted to be our own saviors and to intercede when they just need support and not leaders. And so what you said, uh, Pastor Laura, about not being, um, being a part of the community and not always being a representative is something that we are trying to work on here, which has been a real challenge. Uh, and that's kind of what we're doing here, but I really appreciate this conversation and I'm encouraged to know that um, there are Baptist ministries and ministers willing to work with whoever is doing good for the community and seeking justice in it. So that's all I have to add. That's great, Lara, thank you. Uh, excuse me, Joy. Joy. So uh, I want to go back uh, to uh, to Lara. Are there uh, comments that you want to uh, continue to either to offer or or even uh, questions that uh, you may want to ask of the larger community? Um, I I just I just want to. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for being able to share. I think that. Um, among ourselves as American Baptists, I think that we have so much uh, that is going on and sometimes we don't know what is happening in other places. And I think that uh, empowers us as a community and as a denomination. Um, and I think it was Dr. Clifford who mentioned something, Clifford Johnson, um, and I agree completely with you, sir, um, regarding the trust, the trust of the community. And especially when we have not earned that trust we depend literally on people who does have that trust to introduce us to the community. And I'm, our church is adept with Angel because that's something that Angel did. I don't know if he's aware of it or not, <laughs> but that's something Angel did. Um, he uh, went to the communities that knew him and trusted him and told them that they could trust us. And that made a big difference. Um, so we are, I am in debt to him, uh, but also like I shared with him at some point and people that work with me, like Jocelyn shared with him, um, he loves the people and God loves the people. Um, so we are in the same page, no matter which way we're, or which side we're coming to it. And, and I have to tell you that I have met many people in my life, but 
the way the commitment that Angel has with these people, the people and the community and all the work that he puts to every day and night because he works day and night uh, to help the community and the people is amazing as well as Daniela and the team in Estancia Corazon. And this is just a sample of other people, but I have to emphasize that. Um, yes, Reverend Johnson, we need to earn the trust Sometimes we are not, don't have the time to earn it because we want to help, but we depend on others uh, who, who trust us and, and in a way lend us the trust that the community have in them so that we can go in and do the work. So we, that has been our experience and we are very grateful for that to God first and to partners such as Angel and Daniela and many others. Beautiful. And to uh, to the point that you just offered of being able to hear the stories and the ways that colleagues are engaged that's why we come together in these conversations and so if there are others and i put the question in the chat i i can see you i can call on some of you that i know of the work that you're you're doing but i'm i'm more eager for you to volunteer uh, to, to share about the ways that you are connecting with the decision makers in your communities and, and offering your voice of, of faith. Can anyone else share uh, their experiences? Mark, Mark Samuel. Oh, and a couple of things, um, whether it's- I'm sorry, Mark, if you'll stay where you're from, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm with uh, Heartreach Neighborhood Ministries in Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, we run three community centers, um, all in low-income neighborhoods. Uh, we are, you know, really, we, we seek to introduce people to Christ, but there's a number of avenues um, for, for introducing ourselves to people and a lot, of, a lot of needs in the communities. So one of the ways that we work basically is just by offering what we have in whatever ways we can partner with people, whether that's uh, United Way, foundation representatives, a local group that says they wanted to do things. We have a karate class in, our, in one of our buildings because there's a gentleman from the community that says, I, I like to do karate. So we offer the space for him at no charge just to, to come in and teach karate to kids. He does a phenomenal job. Um, we had one of our local banks say, we want to hold a, a large event to reach out to this low income community. Uh, can we use your space? Absolutely, come on down. Um, so I think it's just for me, just the way I see it is we everything we have, we've been given by God and it's to share and, if, and we do that strategically. It's not just here, take whatever you want, but it's working strategically. And then we're able to work with the, the high funders as well as the neighborhood person that all have gifts and abilities that they can share to, to make the community better. That really, that's been a good model for us. Thank you, Mark. Sandra, can you share please? Sandra Velez. Hi everyone. Um, Laura, beautiful. Thank you very much for the wonderful work and Puerto Rico. And uh, you said a key word that means a lot to me and that's being that bridge. The bridge that opens doors that makes the connections and your connections are of course um, many, but that I've presently heard the testimony of Daniel and is it Daniela and Angel, excuse me, uh -huh. um, was beautiful. So I'm Sandy Velez and, you know, I'm a, I'm a New York Puerto Rican. I'm a New York Rican. I'm from the extended, talk about that bridge. Um, and I grew up, you know, I'm 67. So it's nice to see the young with folks involved and in, in all the beautiful uh, work. But I've seen the, the, um, the highs and lows, the peaks and the valleys when, and um, it's refreshing right now of what's going on in Puerto Rico and, and the beautiful work that you're doing, especially after Maria and, and all the challenges there. So I have a prison ministry that um, was just beautiful in doing that bridging, that connection. And, um, you know, it wasn't just, it was all, all people from different communities of faith and so forth that for years, we just came together 
and, and served inside and outside the prison walls. And then COVID came, came along and it has um, put a, a, a stop. It's, uh, you know, so um, we're uh, praying and, uh, you know, I ask for everyone's prayers um, for um, those behind the walls. But I think it's important that uh, I became, I gave my life to Christ late in life. And I speak to Angel and, and Daniela and that I, you know, I was just turned off by religious structures and so forth. And I grew up in a Christian home. Mi abuelita was Pentecostal. She was a church planter with disciples of Christ in 1919. And Buenavista, Bayamón, Puerto Rico. You know, I mean, like, I come from deep roots, like, right? And um, it is important um, to, to be in community. And, and remember that we're servants and not to be judgmental, but let's also show some um, mercy and grace to each other because <laughs> um, we, we need that as well. And so I thank, I thank everyone. I don't want to take up any more time for this wonderful session together. And um, I, I will keep uh, the voices for justice and prayer and all, all the hard work that's being done out there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Sandra. And, and you're still serving. Are you in, in North Carolina or are you? Um, I, am, I am now in Florida okay. and I am in a position of I'm letting God talk to me, see, see what doors open. I'm, I'm in that place. I'm hoping that... Um, I have good references from the men's federal prison, my chaplains, um, Leon Parker and Luke Langston and so forth, and, and the warden to go into the men's federal prison here in Florida. But yeah, so keep, keep yeah. me in prayer <laughs> that certainly we bridge, that. bridge Florida. <laughs> and I certainly will Thank do that. You. Can I call on, and, and, and in the future, and again, as we are in the practice of, of a meeting regularly. Please don't wait for my invitation uh, to to participate in the conversation. Uh, but I did see a comment uh, that uh, Dr. Patton shared that I'd uh, like you to elaborate on, please, uh, Dr. Marshall. Uh, hi. Um, uh, <clears throat> Campanus started. Um, oh gosh, it's, I think it's been nearly 30 years ago or more, um, uh, where they specifically bring together professionals in the community um, and uh, I don't know why my video won't stay on, but um, particularly, um, so many of them are retired individuals, um, but they've many were recruited specifically by Campanus so that they helped get started uh, uh, um, Ministry of Medical Care for the Homeless. Um, they helped get started um, uh, several different kinds of ministries because they could provide professionals that stepped in for a year or two, sometimes were later hired by the organization um, on an ongoing basis. Right now, I've got a friend that's working through Campanus and, and connected with the Northwest um, African American Museum. So all different kinds of organizations throughout the city um, that they've connected these volunteers, um, uh, professionals to help um, organizations do ministry that they otherwise wouldn't be able to do to, because they would have to pay for directly. Um, Gary Davis is now the executive director of Campanus Ministries. Um, uh, um, it was started when Rod Romney was pastor of Seattle First Baptist Church and Craig Darling was the first executive director. It really is an amazing ministry and can be replicated other places 
using, again, volunteers that are out there and placing them in um, all kinds, all kinds of different um, nonprofits around the, around the city um, and beyond and helping to create marvelous ministries um, in conjunction with others in the city. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Patton. And uh, I'm sorry, was someone jumping in? If you have other examples uh, like Campanias uh, that you know of in, in your community that you wanna offer, place those in the, in the chat for our, our reference as well. Uh, as I said, and there was a question I saw in the chat, uh, a comment, and I was asking um, uh, Pastor Lara, do you feel comfortable uh, either responding or, or commenting to that? Uh, that um... uh, actually, I was just answering through the chat too. Okay. Um, okay. The, the, question, the question is, let me go a little bit back. It says, it's from San. He says, hi, Pastor Laura, thanks for your presentation. Okay, regarding the situation in Myanmar, Burma right now, I have one quick question to you. While the military junta is killing its own people, do you think it is okay to use the church money, especially tithes, to use for supporting who are fighting against the military? Well, I, I just want to, first of all, give a disclaimer. This is my answer, not the church answer, um, but it's my answer. Um, I would say yes. And I, it's because tithing and offerings are not church money, it is mission money. So I think that that's something that we have to educate the church on because sometimes there are things that might um, could be difficult to understand um, if we see that it is our money. Um, so for example, something that I've learned from uh, some of our uh, partners in, in other regions in the U.S. is how can we work towards liberating tithes and offerings from operational expenses? How can we have other uh, incoming funds uh, to support operations and leave offerings and tithes just for mission? Um, all the work of the church. And we are working towards that right now. And, and it's a way of feeling more comfortable, not being impressed by the debts that we have or the things we need to pay every month as a, as a church, because obviously we need to be responsible and do that. But how can we liberate uh, those money so that then we can use them to support mission? And for me, look for, uh, literally look for 18 to 21st. For me, is like an evaluation checklist. If it fits into one of those, then it is mission and then we should consider it. Um, obviously, the local church must always be educated first um, because as we know, we are Baptists. So that means that the congregation will end up making the final decisions on how these monies will be used. But if they are educated first and they know, they understand mission in a broad sense, then they will be able to see it and understand that this is not our money, it is God's money. This is not our building, it is God's building. And whatever is needed to help those in need, then that's where the church should be. Um, so that, that will be my, my response. Thank you for that. Leslie, Dr. Leslie copeland -Tune, have you returned to the call? She needed to step away for another call, but indicated she would be back. And she was one among them that I was asking to comment to this question. Leslie is the uh, Chief Operating Officer of the National Council of Churches. And uh, as I'm speaking, she has not come on screen, which gives me indication that she has not yet returned. So uh, let me invite... Uh, and I'm assuming, Dr. Hagre, at any point, if there's comments you'd like to make, that you will please uh, uh, jump into the conversation. But I am going to, following uh, Dr. Hagre, thank you as he's taken his mic off of mute. After Dr. Hagre, I would like to actually invite, uh, if I could, if uh, Matthew Tennant, if you'll either offer a comment to me if you don't want to share anything, but I'd like to call on Matthew Tennant. I'd like to invite uh, Mia Chang uh, to, to offer uh, a comment. And then I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Phaedra Blocker to offer a comment. So I'll just say those three names uh, and then that may take us to 3.30. If it doesn't, I'll invite others. Dr. Haggett. Sure, sure. Uh, well, I just wanna uh, say thank you uh, 
to all the participants in the call to uh, Pastor Laura for uh, leading this, this conversation about our engagement as people of faith in the community. You know, uh, I, I guess I grew up in a community in, in the southern part of the U.S., in Savannah, Georgia. I'm a child of the 60s and the 70s, where, uh, where there was really no, no line of separation between the church and the community. Uh, in the neighborhood that I grew up west of the tracks in Savannah, Georgia, we were all poor. And from my pastor, we learned how to, how to march down to city hall and demand justice. Uh, they were still dealing with, you know, black, white water fountains when I was a child, uh, desegregated school, busing and schools. And so in all these issues, uh, uh, people, uh, the, the church was the community. The community was the church. It was hard to you know, uh, who is so it was a place where we organized to vote. It was a place where we raised money for the poor and collected clothes and canned goods to carry around the neighborhood and so forth and so on. And, and so I lament the fact that the church has moved away from those kinds of models. Uh, churches of, of color in, in the South and the civil rights era, that, that, that's what we were defining. We were organizing places, that's, that's, they were organizing centers. Uh, and, and, and unfortunately, it is true that as many have done well and, and have, I guess, gotten upper middle class and so forth and so on, we've, removed, we've moved away from our, our justice call. Uh, and, uh, and it's time to hearken back to that. I'm actually sitting in a hotel room on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. I got up 4 a.m. Uh, so I'm actually a little drowsy right now because I came uh, to stand with Reverend Barber and some other people in the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, nine of us uh, drove down to D.C. Uh, 8.30 this morning, I was standing in front of the Supreme Court uh, uh, demanding justice. Uh, 10.30, then we had another rally in front of the Capitol Hill, along with Congress persons uh, calling upon Congress to take action uh, to protect voting rights, uh, calling upon um, uh, the Congress to pass the infrastructure bill for $3.1 trillion, uh, calling attention to the fact that our our government has spent 20 some odd trillion dollars since the start of the Iraq Afghanistan war. And in this good, and compared to that 3.1 trillion dollars is a, is a drop in the bucket compared to what we pay in militarization. So uh, as you've been talking about the issues and the role of the church locally, uh, I just want to ditto all of that. And, 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 and I'm just testifying about how we also have a call nationally uh, to speak truth to power uh, to speak up uh, at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level, and to hold folks accountable. You know, many of our legislatures, so legislators uh, profess to be people of faith. Uh, they say that they are, are people of faith, that they uh, attend houses of worship and so forth and so on. And so uh, I think uh, as people of faith, we do bring a moral voice to the conversation, uh, you know, um, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed as a person of faith to stand publicly uh, as a person of faith and as a pastor and preach truth to power, use the influence that I have, the voice that I have, the platforms that we have, the, the house, the, the facilities that we have as, as organizing centers uh, and so forth. And so it is true in, in many areas, uh, the church has been compromised uh, and, and is isolated from the communities. Uh, and I think that's something to overcome. Uh, and I think as we practice the ministry of Jesus, uh, and walk where Jesus walked right here in the streets of our cities, <laughs> uh, holding hands with, with the, the poor and the underserved as Jesus did. Uh, and, and all of, I mean, his whole ministry is about the uplift of the downtrodden. And, uh, and so if anything, we as a church uh, need to repent to whatever extent we have moved away uh, there, there is nothing that we're doing of a ritual value inside church that is more important than the uplift of all who are hurting. I mean, you know, and I'll, my last word on this, uh, you know, my favorite passion is in the New Testament is Acts 2, uh, 42 through 47. Uh, and, it's, and it's the first century church. All who believed were, the, were together. They had all things in common. They, they literally sold their possessions <laughs> and gave the money to the poor, right? I mean, it was like they put their, their, their property on eBay, sold it when they got the money, they passed it around the church. They had an internal redistribution system at church. The church existed to serve the community. 
they, 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 these are all the things. So if we, if we really want to be more like Jesus and want to be like the first century church, then engagement in our communities now more than ever before is critical. So I just, God bless all of you who are doing this important work, uh, Pastor Ayala and, and the example that you've said and many others on this call, Pastor Clifford Johnson there in Delaware. I mean, so many of you are doing some awesome things in your community. And God bless you. And I just thank you. Thank you for this conversation today. Thank you. Matthew. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, thank you, Jeffrey. That was uh, inspiring to hear about the work you're doing. And also, thank you to everybody who's commented. Laura, I really, really have enjoyed hearing about how uh, what you've been doing in Rio Piedras. Um, about 20 years ago, I lived in Puerto Rico. And so I am familiar with some of those neighborhoods in, in that area. Um, I was thinking about how University Baptist in Charlottesville is engaging with the community and what I'd be able to share. Um, and, I, and I don't necessarily have a specific um, uh, ministry in mind. Um, the Unite the Right rally from 2017 uh, continues to come up every so often here in Charlottesville. Uh, just yesterday, the trial of uh, for some of the organizers began here. And one thing that came to mind is the ministry of presence and the way that uh, a lot of the ministers in this area have been either holding virtual prayer vigils or vigils or gathering to try to be a peaceful presence around the courthouse. But uh, justice is important in many different forms, whether it's uh, food insecurity or um, uh, reaching out and ministering to people with HIV and AIDS. So I was especially interested in the Estancia Corazon uh, ministry at, at First Baptist. And, um, but here we, we uh, I feel like there are a number of little things. Our church gathers food for uh, food insecure homes in a local elementary school. And one of our teenagers needed some volunteer hours for school. So he came and was packing uh, backpacks, uh, packing the food bags. And, it, and it's just a, a microcosm of, of trying to, to touch justice issues while listening to local leaders and, and what their needs are. And so like in that food program, we we are directed by the guidance counselors in the school. They're the ones who tell us what they need and how much they need. And we try to, we try to just uh, answer their, their call. But it's, it's inspiring to hear so many people in the different ways that, um, that you're involved. And um, I've been taking notes. Uh, so when Lisa, when you said you want to hear from me, I was like, wait, wait, I'm, I'm thinking about and kind of switching tabs, Googling other, uh, these other ministries. Uh, so it, but it's been great to hear it from everybody. Appreciate your comments. Yes. Continue the, the note taking, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mia, can we hear from you? And then uh, Phaedra, a few words from you will be great. Thanks, Lisa, for the opportunity. And thank you all for your comments and your thoughts. Uh, it's, it was an enriching uh, time. I uh, just want to add um, you know, to what's already been said, but I think that today uh, with the pandemic and, and um, you know, so many people, so many churches and leaders being afraid and uncertain of how to engage the community you know, in times like this, that we tend to be more isolated and we tend to be more inward focused than, than looking outward. You know? and, um, and, and especially as a, a pastor, you know, I hear so many of the other leaders wondering um, in, in times of pandemic and post pandemic, um, how, do we, how do we reach out to our community? How do we bring people back in? How do we increase and or, or go back to the, the way things were? But, you know, I, I think we, we tend to look at approach these uh, questions with strategies and, and formulas uh, for increase. But um, 
you know, if we can actually look outward and, and see the, the concerns of our, our neighborhoods, uh, the places of pain and places of, of need, you know, around where, where I am, there are, you know, we're focusing on Trenton right now, but, you know, there are increase in violence, increase in uh, mental health issues. You know, these are real, real concerns. And so if we were to to address some of these uh, these areas that are, are are you know the places of pain, then we don't really need to worry about strategies of increasing our church and, and so on. If we are if we were to just uh, tap into what Jesus is already doing and where where His heart is, if we were to to sort of align with where God's heart is, then um, I think that the increase in the health of our church will just be uh, a natural, um, sort of a natural overflow, you know? And, and so uh, so I, I think that the approach to this time of pandemic and post-pandemic is that to, to see where Jesus is, where Jesus is standing and to, to, to stand alongside the poor and the hurting. And when we do so as church, then we will see the growth. We will see the natural uh, thriving and the, the revival of our congregations. Thank you. Dr. Phaedra. There has been um, so much um, said today that I echo, co-sign, um, and just resonates with me. Thank you all for, thank you, Dr. Ayala. Um, when you talked about liberating our tithes and offerings, um, there, there was a Baptist shout that went up in this room. Um, and uh, because it, this idea of really putting our time, talent and treasure towards the things that matter to Jesus um, is, is so important. And, and we do, we have to, we, we got a lot of liberating to do in, in some cases. Um, I, you know, I, I don't have anything profound to add. I'm just grateful for all of you. I'm grateful for how you are uh, living the gospel in in each of your contexts and and being able, grateful to uh, Lisa and ABHMS to get it, for this type of gathering where folks can hear what's happening, hear what's going on, uh, be able to encourage and be encouraged. Um, and know that you're not alone. Because sometimes when folks are doing the work, it seems like you're the only one doing the work. Um, I, I spend a lot of my days uh, training leaders for the church. And, and so, it, you know, knowing that what we are doing, at, even as a seminary and our focus on, you know, your theology is wonderful, but it has to hit the ground somewhere and it has to hit the ground in the place where it is doing the doing the gospel that Jesus preached um, is very important to us. And so as I listen to the conversation today and, and to the voices and to the work uh, that's being done, um, the, the saying that came to mind, the quote that came to mind um, was actually from St. Francis of Assisi, who wasn't Baptist, but probably would have been in the right time if he'd come along at the right time. Um, but his quote, you know, preach the gospel, use words if necessary, I think is what you all are doing, is you all are preaching the gospel. You are making the gospel live. Um, and where you need to have words, you have words. But more importantly, where you need to have the loving action, the decisive action, the advocacy action, um, you are doing that. And, and so I, again, I'm just grateful for you and just grateful to be, in, be able to be in your midst today. Thank you. Thank you for taking time to be uh, in our midst and that I echo for everybody who is present this afternoon. Uh, we are bringing this conversation today to a close and to be continued on uh, December 1st. Oh, excuse me. Uh, yes, December 1st, Wednesday, December 1st will be our next convening and uh, you'll get uh, some information uh, about that for registration. We will post this recording in, in new, various places. It will be sent directly to your email, but it will also be posted uh, on our uh, website by uh, early next week. Uh, and, and so we're 
prepared and I'm going to invite, I want to invite someone and I'm, I'm looking around the room to see uh, who looks ready uh, to, to close us um, uh, in, well, to close us in, in prayer this afternoon. I think uh, I, I'm going to invite uh, Stan, Stan Moody. Can you please close us in prayer and following um, his prayer? And let me just uh, ask this, uh, Dr. Jeff, do uh, you have any other comments that you'd like to make to the community? Uh, sure, let me just okay. say quickly uh, uh, to everyone, again, thanks everybody for joining the call. We, we uh, really are committed to wanting to continue the justice, East Justice Dialogues on a monthly basis. Uh, just a word again about the mission of this. We, it's, uh, we're aware that so many of us uh, as people of faith are working on various issues from education to justice for healthcare, justice environment, justice, uh, democratic voting justice, uh, economic justice uh, for children, for women, for families, and so on. And what we wanted to do is just create this space where we can meet other folks uh, outside our own, our local church, outside our communities. Uh, and this call today is a great example of that. There are people on this call from across the United States and Puerto Rico. And so to say that you're not alone in, the, in answering God's call uh, to engage in your community in whatever way you're doing that. So our hope is that you will get to know other people in time yeah. as we keep doing this. Uh, you'll learn some of the folks on this call. Feel free at any time when we meet to, to put your website in the chat, uh, your contact or what you do or where you're engaged. Someone may hear you and want to follow up with you or learn more about what you're doing, uh, how they can connect with you outside these calls. We're really just trying to build a network of, of folks who are, are engaged in a wide range of issues. And, uh, and to say that we are brothers, sisters, we are family, we're family together as we work on all these different issues. So God bless you. Thank you for, for being here. Uh, I hope that we can grow together, get to know each other and, and, and truly be partners uh, in, in trying to change the world. Uh, so thank you so much. And following Stan's prayer, please stay on the call to complete the evaluation, which includes a request for specific subjects areas that you have interest in the conversation, uh, hearing more from it, uh, within this community. So please take time following uh, Dr. Stan's prayer uh, to stay on the call, complete the evaluation, and then continue uh, with the rest of your day. Thank you. Our heads in prayer, shall we? Gracious Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to be with kindred spirits who have awakened to the need to reach out to the community and are patiently going forward, teaching others in their communities of worship what a critical issue this is. And Lord, we're not asking for numbers. We're asking that you would give us the courage and the heart to respond to opportunities as they occur. What a privilege it is, Father, to be serving you in a time of uncertainty. And we'd ask, Lord, that you would raise up more folks who are willing to be the person of Jesus Christ to their communities so that we may reach others for, with the gospel, by deed, and then by word. Thank you, Father. Go with us to our respective homes and keep us faithful and help us to be always looking for opportunities to find our way home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So we'll have the evaluation and, and even continue putting comments in the chat. Thank you, Dr. Rosalind. The poll is frozen. Sorry. I'll send it out in an email.
Oh, that's fine, Beverly. Thank you for your technical support. Do you want another moment to try or? or... Uh, let's see. Oh, there it goes. There you go. Okay. When I click on the submit, it's not going through. Yeah, I think it's. Um, you scroll not, down. Do you keep scrolling down? I think uh, it's not wanting to to work. Okay. All right. Well, we'll send it out as you indicated, Beverly, and 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 also in previous opportunities, I know people can check more than one uh, category uh, for options. So let's uh, let's work on that, and we'll get this to you as soon as possible. So are we saying, Lisa, we're going to send this out to the folks on the call, the polls, so they can do it on That's their yes. own? Yes. Okay, thank you. That, that'll work because I'm having difficulty too. All right, thank you. Thanks for your patience, everyone. Have a good rest thank of you. your day. Thank you, everyone. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye. 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 Thanks Bye, for being a part of it. Bye. 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 Thanks for leading us so well. All right, everyone. Great job. My, my apologies, Lisa. Okay. It's okay, Beth. It's all right. Yeah, I know you, it will happen once we uh, send it out and they'll respond, but uh, everybody was very engaged. So that was exciting. The, um,